William. What a pleasure it is to greet you this evening. I'm honored to introduce Yvette Donado to you today. We share much in common. I was born in Puerto Rico. Yvette's family is Puerto Rican. I spent many years working in New York City. Yvette was born and educated there. I grew up in northern New Jersey, and Yvette lives and works there today. We also share a passion for improving the lives of Latinos and other underserved populations through the power of a college education. Yvette has spoken many, many times across this great country about the relationship between education and economic opportunity, social mobility, and political engagement. She knows, given the changing demographics of this nation and the requirements of today's workplace, that we are at a critical moment in our country's history. If we do not provide opportunities for our growing po population of Latino youth to go to college, our nation will not survive in the global economy. That is why the work that Yvette is doing as the Chief Administrative Officer at Educational Testing Service is so important to our Latino community and young people throughout our country. She is keenly aware of trends occurring in education within our society. She has a sense of best practices in teaching out to, to, in, to our English language learners and improving classroom pedagogy. As she continues to advocate across our land for young people, she has the dreams that they have in her hands and in her mind. It is fitting that Yvette Donato delivered today's Tomas Rivera lecture. The late Dr. Rivera was a member of a family of farm workers. He combined his own talent, his self-discipline, and commitment to education to eventually become the chancellor of the University of California, Riverside. He and Yvette Donado are inspirations to all of us in this room. Prior to joining ETS in 2001, Yvette spent more than 25 years in the private sector. She knows what it takes to run a business and serve a market. It is no surprise that she has been named one of the nation's top five Latina executives by Latina Style Magazine in 2013. In 2012, Hispanic Business Magazine named Yvette as one of the nation's top 50 influential Hispanics. She is a servant leader an author, a teacher, and an advocate for students everywhere in this country. Again, I am honored and delighted to introduce to you Yvette Donado. Yvette? Congratulations to you, Thank too. you. Whenever I hear those introductions, I always say I have no idea who they're talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was so kind, Elsa. I was actually nervous that I was going after Louis because Dr. Olivas was so funny and so entertaining. I said, who could beat that? It was really fantastic. But, you know, as I sat here listening, and I'm here every year, uh, I'm very, very touched about being selected. This is a huge honor because the value systems that this organization holds are so dear to my heart and to the hearts also of the people that work for Educational Testing Service. And it is all about advancing equity and quality in education because as we know, that is the only way that this nation can be ready for what is going to happen. If our kids are not ready and they can't assume leadership, then that will be a disaster. Our relationship with uh, Ahi has been very productive and very, very special. And so last fall, when uh, my, my CEO retired and appointed someone else by the name of Walt McDonald, he decided that he was going to encourage Educational Testing Service to take another look at what it does. And while what we do is very important because we assess the, the information in, that we acquire through our school history, it's also more important that we turn our attention to those who haven't been as lucky, who haven't been as fortunate to take advantage of what we do because their educational experience is not equal to those that live in better zip codes. And so therefore, he created something called the Council on the Mission, and he asked me to chair it. So part of this, part of my job will be to take a look at every activity that we do and have top of mind how does that activity support the disadvantaged, the ones that aren't well resourced. And so that's not a small task. It's something that I look forward to doing. And of course, because so many of our own children live in poverty, it's something that will benefit 
both African American, Hispanic, and even white, white Americans who also live in poverty. So there were three milestones that caused the educational testing service to draw their attention to this. We've been around since 1947, and for those of you who don't know the history, we were not created to screen people out. We were created to screen people in. Prior to that time, getting into college meant that you were white and that you had money and that you had a name. And mostly that, those were the folks that went to Ivy League. Well, when our boys went off to war, James Conant and Henry Chauncey said, something is wrong about that. There has to be a way that others who are also have fine minds can prove that they can access higher education. And so the SAT was created for that purpose. And so that's an interesting piece of information that not everyone is aware of because sadly they think of us as screening out, but actually we're about screening in and about delivering opportunity. So there were three things that happened at ETS that were milestones. Is this fine, darling? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that were milestones in terms of our changing direction. Thank you, dear. One was the visit of Dr. Juan Andrade. For those of you who don't know him, he's another great man. In 2007, he came to ETS. He was our Hispanic Heritage Month speaker, and he talked about what it was like to be a Latino teacher in Texas and be arrested for speaking in Spanish in class because he noticed that the classroom, the kids weren't responding to him. And he said to them, what if I speak to you in Spanish? And they all said, yes, please. And he was arrested because it was illegal in this country to teach in Spanish. And that was something that affected us deeply and made us wonder about the needs of our Latino children. The second was another person that you may know something about. His name is Dr. Luis Olivas. And he came to us in 2009, and you, you, you can see what a charismatic leader he is and what a great presenter he is. And he came with many charts, and it was very entertaining and very fun, but there was also a very important message to ETS and to our CEO. And that was, what are you doing about this demographic imperative? And he came very prepared to give Kurt Langraff lots of data, and Kurt said, stop, I got it. <laughs> you had me at hello. <laughs> he got it, and not only did he get it, but he really put his money where his mouth is, and, and you know, I'm very grateful to Louis for having brought this to our attention. The third person I want to credit is Dr. Marta Tienda, who also did a Tomas Rivera lecture. She's a great woman. She is a doctor uh, working at Princeton University and she's a major in sociology. And there again, she gave incredible information about the need to do something about English language learners. It was very well attended and it was tearful because this woman is so devoted to doing something about this very critical problem. So we had those three events in rapid succession. We realized we needed to raise the bar. We realized we needed to engage this cohort and it also, we also realized that in order to do that, we had to strengthen our relationship with AHI. So ETS is moving full throttle into the Hispanic arena, and two things stood out for me. Number one, I spent two decades in New York with a software company where I did not leverage the fact that I was Latina. It wasn't about that. Uh, but I realized that that was something that was gonna be very useful to me now. And I wanted to make sure that I did something important and that I did something that mattered, not so much for me, but because of my parents. Uh, my parents are my hero. They, were, they met in New York City. My father's mother died when he was only nine years old. He was a poet and a draftsman who never went to high school, very, very bright, always talked to us, sang to us. Uh, my parents sang beautiful, beautiful duets at night. My mother, who dreamed of coming here to go to high school at the age of 16, instead went to a factory to work. She was such a learner, always looking at the dictionary, always reading, always wanting to speak English properly, always wanting to speak Spanish properly. And from her, I had the love of books. And these two people produced four daughters. And I'm very, very humbled because I wish my dad were alive to know that I'm here doing this because it would touch him deeply and my mother. So anyhow, these two people who never went to college, my mother then went on to get a GED and then went on to do some really good work at Veterans Administration working with young men 
uh, who were disabled, and so I'm very, very proud of that for her sake. And my father, while he did not go that route, he was always encouraging young people, including her da his daughters, the need and importance to get a proper education. So he said, it, it isn't about competing or it isn't about money. Whatever you do, I don't care about the money and I don't want you to care about the money, but whatever you do, make sure you do it 100%. And how did he instill that in his daughters? Whenever we came home, he'd say, whenever we brought our report cards, he'd say, Mija, was that the best that you could do? Are you sure that was the best that you could do? And so you always had this, this, this challenge that you could do better, that you could push yourself further. And from that came, his eldest child is a school psychologist working in a high school where the children sadly are so sick, they, they have to have bars. And the, he, she lost two of these students in this last quarter, unfortunately, who committed suicide. And I've said to her, because she now has fibromyalgia and other illnesses, I've said to her, can't you move to a school where there aren't so many problems, where you're not so depleted when you come home? And she said, no, because these are the kids. These are the kids that really, really need me. My other sister got a, a degree in education, started her own daycare center, did that for a long time, then decided to come to, she was in Binghamton, New York, now she lives in New Jersey, she's become a paralegal, working for the Department of Labor and adjudicating, and she loves that activity. My other sister has three degrees, one in sociology, one in multiculturalism, and the other in, in, uh, as a master in social work. And she is an amazing young lady has two beautiful small boys, and works very, very hard to help her community, and it's work that she loves. And so then there's me. Uh, I feel, <laughs> well, you know, gotta <laughs> then there's me. Um, I feel very, very blessed, because as a young Latina out of school, the, the stars aligned. I was hired by a really wonderful man in Manhattan who really encouraged me and was just dynamite. I mean, it was, it was our interpretation of what today is considered a startup. We were small, we, were, we weren't big, we weren't rich, but it was the most fun I had ever had. He had a lot of confidence in me, and as we started growing, and what this organization did, and actually they're still around, and just to show you how fabulous this family is, his son is Sean Donovan, who today is at the cabinet working for President Obama. So his father, Michael Donovan, is the one who hired me. And so it's kind of funny when I look at the Obama administration in this last uh, State of the Union, you could see his son there all the time. But the point I wanted to make is when I realized that we were growing, I also noted that we weren't taking the best care of our employees' needs. You know, we didn't have the right programs for them. And so I said to the president, you know, uh, we've got to do something about doing better for our employees. I'm not comfortable that we're doing everything that's necessary. For example, and just so that you get the idea of how old I am, that during that time it was legal to discriminate against pregnancy. So we could cover everything, and when a woman wanted to have a child, that was considered disqualified. And so when I went back to NYU to get uh, my certification in human resources, which at that time was called personnel and human relations, which is very different from today. Anyhow, I said to my president, if you don't cover the women, and if women can't have babies and be covered, I'm quitting, because I will not be part of an organization that doesn't take care of its women. That had an impact on him, and thankfully, <laughs> he agreed to add that, and we made other, other wonderful changes that I'm very, very pleased we did, because because we took good care of our, our, our family, because they do become like your family, I think that the, the contribution I made to make that organization world class and global served everyone well. And I deeply understood that you needed to marry good businesses, business and people practices in order to be truly successful. And of course, you have to have a leadership team that really cares, that really gets that at the end of the day, it's all about the people. So after two decades there, uh, I had the privilege of having dinner with the new CEO of Educational Testing Service, and that was in 2001, or actually late 2000, and then I started in 2001. And what he painted for me was a dismal picture of this organization is liquidating. You know, we're about to become a golf course, and everything is screwed up. I said, really? 
And uh, I said, well, how could that happen? It sounds like it has the best educational measurement scientists in the world, and so much of what it does is hard, highly regarded. And it was because while all of those good things were happening, what wasn't happening is there was there were business disciplines were not there, the infrastructure was not there, the dedication to quality and logistics was not there because it just wasn't where their focus was. So he said, you know, I'm not I'm not telling you it's a walk in the park. So if you come to work, you know, it's going to be a lot of hard work. And then he said to me, I I need to know something. Are you going to push back because you know. I've got these people that work for me, you know, they're very scared of me, they just tell me what, I, what they think I want to hear, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, let me help you, darling. If you don't want to know what I'm thinking, don't hire me, because I don't know how to be anything else but that. And that sealed the deal. And uh, I'm with him, I was with him for 13 years, and I'm happy to say that the organization is thriving and doing very, very well. And we're now a $1.6 billion dollar Nonprofit. Not everybody understands that we are nonprofit because they hear that number and it sounds really, really big. And it is big. But the difference is we are not accountable to shareholders. All of that money goes back into the sciences, goes back into technology, goes back into the science of learning, and allows us to hire phenomenal people that think every day about how are we going to make it better. And that's a privilege. It's a real privilege to work for an organization that's devoted to that. And the work of the Council on the Mission is intended to make sure that now that we have these wonderful resources, can we do more for the undeserved? Can we do more for the disadvantaged? Because their educational experience is not what it is for others, we've got to pay attention to that. So one of the things I heard when I went on my tour of listening was, the desperate need for English language learners to have a common instrument so that they wouldn't be placed with special ed children or in the wrong level or simply just forgotten because of the English language proficiency. There is no uniform tool in this country for properly assess assessing our children with regard to English language proficiency. So Frank Gomez, who's in the audience, and. He and I went to a lot of places and spoke to a lot of good people, and Dr. Romo also, and other educators in this room gave us very good advice. Because I gotta tell you something, I was very humbled by how complicated the education space is. I came from a world where if you built the best mousetrap and you priced it correctly, that was all you needed to do. In the education space, it is so, so complicated. And that's why this work is very, very humbling. This education is local. There are a lot of different constituents, a lot of people that are interested, and everybody's got an agenda. Sadly, not everyone's agenda is about what's best for the children. And so you're competing with a lot of forces. But we knew that we had to do something about these six million English language learners who are not being assessed correctly. And so we have, we have, a, we have created a wonderful tool that will be released later this year. And that tool will be on an iPad and has already been piloted with children as small as kindergartners up to fifth grade. And it's just a pleasure to see how they take the iPad and instantly are able to connect with that. Because one of the things that I realize, and that I know you know, is if Abraham Lincoln came back to, school, back to, back to, back to life, he'd go to the school system and find that things haven't changed. In the meantime, our children have become so technically savvy, so used to doing things, you know, H, uh, 3D and all the Ds, and they can figure everything out. If I don't know what I'm doing on my little Vio, I just can ask a six-year-old and he can figure it out. If something's wrong with your TV set, who do you ask the kids? So they're all ahead of us. They're all miles ahead of us. And we're all too old to understand the things that they already know, and there'll be jobs when they get to be our age that we can't even imagine. And that's another thing that's gotta change. We've gotta change our system so that school is fun and entertaining because that's the world that they live in and that's what they require. So, through a collaboration with Dr. Patricia Gandara, and I know you know who she is of UCLA, she is also going to be making a wonderful contribution to this conversation. She's doing a study on the economic benefits of bilingualism. That's another thing that's really, really important. 50 million Americans speak Spanish. 
In Spain, there are 46 million. So figure it out. So after Mandarin, the next language that is most spoken is Spanish. The third language is English. So think about the power of that. And so we want to encourage not just the Latinos to learn Spanish. I have a feeling that everybody should learn Spanish, but that's my personal opinion. OK. So we're also doing some really good work around preparedness. And we recognize that the SAT and the GRE scores, they're important, but that's just one factor. And it doesn't necessarily predict success or failure. It's just one data point. There are other things beyond that number. And I'm not saying that those numbers aren't important for us to acquire and to do well at. But what I'm saying is it just gives you one dimension. So, we're also looking at something called non-cognitive attributes, and you know what those are. It's that grit, that grit, those life skills that the people in this room have, it's the reason why you're successful. It's leadership, it's communication, it's organization skills, it's integrity, it's persistence. And we need to figure out how do we measure those attributes? When our children go to kindergarten, our studies show that our children are already at an advantage, and I mean advantage, it's not a mistake, when it comes to those skills. But those non-cognitive skills, because they're not measured, our children are not credited with that. And so while they may have an achievement gap and some disadvantage because they haven't heard all of the words, vocabularies, having, maybe haven't gone to museums, et cetera, they come with something else that's really, really important for a successful life. And we need to make sure we find a way to assess it so that we capture it, encourage it, and nurture it. So why do we say America's prosperity is dependent on Hispanic academic success? If we still have that question after seeing all those beautiful young people here, then we weren't listening. Over the last decade, we've learned a lot about education and many outstanding Hispanic leaders. We've learned, for example, about the dreamers. And we have to do something about that issue. We have to do something. You know, we keep waiting. And you know, I know Obama wants to do it. But I think it's, it's a grassroots. I think it's those kids walking to Washington, doing the things that they do, being prepared to go to jail if they have to. And it's also about us supporting them and doing something to make sure that we will not, we will not put up with this anymore. So I think most of, most of you in the crowd are my age. So, and if you're not, you're close or you're, or you're older. There's an old movie called Network, Albert Finney, Faye, D Faye Dunaway. I don't know if you remember it, but Albert Finney in this movie gets so fed up. He opens the window, puts his head out, and he says, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Do you remember? Well, that's what we need to do. We need to be mad as hell, and we need not to take it anymore. And I know that there is power in numbers, and people are now getting it. So think about a life, think about a world where Latinos, African Americans, poor whites, all took their hands and all worked on these problems that are now uh, confronting this, 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 uh, this country. I know, I feel confident that we could make something really happen. So we talked about, you know, uh, Louis, Dr. Olivas gave us lots of wonderful statistics, so I'm going to try not to do the same, although I'm going to do some of it. New Jersey has become a microcosm where more and more of New Jerseyans are Latinos. That was something that was just not that way when I got there in 1989. Um, we were delighted to join Ahi to publish a, a lecture that talked about what we need to be reinventing and doing. And by the way, if you did not read Perspectivas, I read it this morning and it's really fantastic. So there's lots of good learning in there. And some, so some folks still believe, but even after all of this, that Latinos don't care about education. And I'm sure that you've had, that you can tell many stories and anecdotes. So I will give you a quick story. I had, a, I had lunch recently with two headhunters 
And I don't know how we got into the conversation of education and they said, well, you know, the issue with Latinos is that they don't care about education. And so I said, well, th where did you get that data? I says, well, statistics show that they don't show up for parents, for, for parent meetings, they're not as engaged, et cetera. I said, well, may, that may have something to do with the fact that they have three jobs. So I said, you know what? When, since I know that you were at all the parent-teacher conferences, do you remember when those conferences were held? And she says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, right, so that's the reason why those parents aren't there. It's not because they don't give a damn. By the way, Parent Step Ahead, based in Dallas, has done wonderful work, and maybe you know Lupita Colmonero. I love her. She and her husband, Robert Bard, are doing a lot of good work. She went to a school, and actually ETS also invests in them and sponsors them because, like Ahi, they're doing really amazing work. So she, Lupita Colmonero, went to a school and said, I want to have an activity with the parents. The parents need to get involved. And the principal said, you're wasting your time. We're always trying to get them here. You don't get it. They're not interested. And she said, that's not true. Latino parents care. It is the most, besides getting work and being able to put food on the table, the thing that worries parents more than anything is, are their kids getting the right education? So he said, well, knock yourself out. I've been trying for years. Nothing's going to happen. So, he, so she said, well, what about if we did it on Saturday? And he said, that's OK. I'll open the school. We can do it on Saturday. So he says, uh, she says, well, how many people do you think are going to show up? And he says, oh, you won't get more than 60 people. 600 people showed up. 600. And they had to call McDonald's because uh, someone from McDonald's is on that board. And they supplied the breakfast. And they had to call McDonald's and say, you got to bring a whole lot more of those <laughs> breakfast sandwiches because we got a lot more people than we ever imagined. So this whole nonsense that we don't care about education you know, it's really sad that we keep perpetuating those kinds of, of uh, myths and, you know, it's a form of racism. But what's really, really important is to demonstrate by example that we are going to be at the table, that we are players. So research and experience has consistently shown, of course, the correlation between educational attainment and success. This is something that we... There, there is no, it's non-negotiable. If we want to have quality of life, we're going to have to make sure that all children are educated and all children have as much opportunity as the people in this room. So and we also know that with education, you increase your personal and public health, your overall quality of life, and you strengthen communities, societies, increase wealth heighten interest in environmental quality, promote harmony and collaboration among people of different backgrounds and different cultures. Societies with higher levels of education have lower levels of AIDS, of HIV, of infant mortality, they live longer, there's greater economic output, and they are more stable and more productive. And as if you needed more evidence, Angelo, Falcon, the president of the National Institute of Latino Policy, just wrote a report in which he just talked about the tragedy of not having education, married with poverty, married with not eating the right foods. And in the South Bronx today, they have the highest rate of asthma, of heart attacks, of high cholesterol, and diabetes. And so this is something that we really need to attack because we don't want to lose all those wonderful people, all those students that tomorrow could be leaders. So it really is something that we have to look at. And look, there's a lot of good stuff too. So I don't, you know, today was another affirmation that there are a lot of wonderful people doing beautiful work, which is why we have these folks. Not too long ago, I was at a Nashimba conference and I was there with 5,000 MBAs. And I say to myself, darn it, why can't we get these people to come work for ETS? And we're working on that, right, Carolyn? We're working on that. <laughs> ETS.org, in, in case anybody here is looking for a job. We really want to increase our diversity in the workforce too. Uh, so we don't have a magic wand, but I know that we're making progress. That's clear. So what else do we have to do? We've got to have quality quality daycare. Our kids don't have the kind of daycare that other people have, and you got to have that. Three years old. At three years old, there is a window of opportunity. That's when, they, that's when they're a sponge. We're not taking advantage of that. 
not because we don't want to, but because the parents don't have the money to pay for quality daycare center. And we need to make sure that that becomes available to all of our, all of our parents and that it's affordable. We also need teacher quality across the board because we know that in the lousy neighborhoods, that's not where they send the veteran teachers. That's not where they want to teach, right? They send the newbies there. And on top of that, those newbies have no training in, in multiculturalism, no training in what it's like to be in front of a diverse classroom. So that's another thing that's got to change. We've got we've to reduce the dropout rates. We have to make it easier to access higher education. And of course, again, that speaks to affordability. So here's a statistic. Three out of four adults in the top quarter income earn a degree by 24. One out of three in the next quarter. I don't need to tell you the rest. So higher high school and post-secondary graduation rates have to happen if we're going to be competitive as a nation. Increased numbers of Hispanic college presidents, administrators, and faculties. We heard that over and over again. The numbers are depressing. I don't know what's going on, but I asked, I asked Mili Garcia what, what's going on, and she says, well, these wonderful people are retiring and they're being replaced by Caucasians. And that, while there's nothing wrong with that, what's wrong with that is Children need to have role models, and if they don't see Latinos in positions of power, they can't see themselves being there tomorrow, and that's the problem with that. So, um, we, education is evolving, things are getting a little bit better, but we're not, we, we, what I wanna stress to you is that we cannot be spectators. We have to move from doubt and uncertainty to assured progress along the pathways with built-in success and, fa and fail-safe mechanisms. I'm the eternal optimist. Like you, I hope for a better America down the road. I hope for a more prosperous America with greater opportunities for the disadvantaged. I hope for a day when Hispanics will claim their rightful place not only in education, but in every arena in which dedication and intelligence are the essential ingredients. As a people, something that I love about being Latina is that it's not our way to be vindictive. We don't go away, away being angry, and we don't believe in an eye for an eye, because that doesn't make anyone better, and it reduces us to the level of other people who may think that way. I love that we're not, it's not about that for us. It's about how do we get what's rightly ours. I note that while there's a general malaise, a, a lack of drive among some Americans, and I'm sure you must, have feel, you must feel this too when you don't notice the same drive and vision and also the lack of, of customer service. Uh, you know what? I've traveled, I've had the blessing of traveling to many parts of the world, and I used to say, I, I can't wait to get back home where I won't have to deal with this nonsense because I felt that people just didn't treat each other right and that there wasn't that attention to service. Now, very sadly, you know what I say? I can't wait to get out of here so I can get some customer service. I was in Mexico just two weeks ago. I had a marvelous time. It is such a beautiful country. I stayed at the Maya Riviera was just so beautiful. And what made it so nice, it wasn't just that it was a beautiful beach, it's that the people were so warm and loving and thank you and please, y como le puedo ayudar? It was just fantastic. On the way home in customs, a beautiful young American couple behind me said, well, I know we're not in Mexico anymore. You know why? Nobody says thank you, nobody says es un placer, nobody says de nada, everybody, they grunt over there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really sad because it wasn't always that way. And, you know, another thing that we, the, the other thing though that I notice, even though there's this general malaise, and a lot of that is because the recession is still here and we haven't gotten back to where we ought to be, I also want to commend the Latinos who have stood tall and have said, it's enough of this nonsense. You have to, you have to acknowledge that we have Latinos that are incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, talented. And you know, what happened at the, what, with the protests around not acknowledging Latinos at the Kennedy Center for their arts, you know, that was a fantastic thing. 
cheering people cheering on Sonia Sotomayor when she's when she got appointed to be a Supreme Court judge I mean these there are really lots of things for us to celebrate but we need to have immigration reform that's something that we cannot continue to abide by that's got to happen I'm privileged to meet many amazing Latinos of influence and in the political arena and I invite us all to continue to be civically engaged. Forget about party lines. They're not interesting. What's interesting is, are they, do they have ideas that are good for you? Are they doing the right things by your children? That's what we have to care about. We have to have the courage to address the most critical issues facing us and our nation. So let's be determined not to fight over the crumbs that fall off the table. It's our turn to be at that table. That's where we want to be. We want to be at that table. We want to represent our agenda in our own voice. It is enough to have other people talk about our issues. Only we can solve our issues, and we've got to be do it. We have to be prepared to take a stand against the injustice and the tyranny of low expectations and the tragedy of school funding by zip code. That is the greatest crime against our children, that if you happen to live in a poor place, your schools are not going to be the quality that you deserve. This nonsense about funding schools by zip code is another tragedy and is another reason why we partner with the Educational Law Center because they're trying to do something about it. And we've got to help organizations that are on that. So those of us in the room, we're the lucky ones, right? We're informed, we're educated, we're connected. So let's pledge to use these connections. Use them to insist on collaboration by nonprofits, by educators and leaders and legislators. Let's get it together. Let's not have all these small organizations trying to do something when we could do so much more if we work together. So the recession, while has, it has been very difficult and incredibly hard on a lot of people, let me tell you what the redeeming feature is. The redeeming feature, feature for me and I think for you, is that people of every race, ethnicity, religion, political ideology have suffered together. Those people that were the middle class are now part of our poor. So what does that do? It creates a moment for compassion. People start understanding oh wow, you know, I used to think it was those people. I used to think it was they were lazy. They didn't want to work, but now I don't have work either. Maybe they're not so lazy. Maybe there's a reason why they don't, why don't, they don't have work because I can't find work. So this is a moment. This is the moment. At once, forces have converged in ways that make it possible for others to imagine what it would be like what would happen if the undocumented didn't come to work for one day? What if they didn't come to work for a whole week on top of all this stuff? Can you imagine? People would go completely berserk, but the goodness of that would be that they would understand that they can't do it without us, and we can't do it without them, as someone said before. There is power in numbers, and without education and a strong agenda intended to lift all boats, we will fall short of our potential as humans, as people, as friends, as brothers, as sisters. President Obama recently said that we need to be our brother's keepers. Really? 47 million Americans go to, hung go to bed hungry every day. Is that the way we treat our brothers and sisters? No, it's not. We've got to do more than that. And you know what I love about Ahi? Uh, and why I come to every conference is because I really think that they get it. I think they're doing all the wrong things, all the right things, pardon me. <laughs> the only wrong thing you did was to put me right before the meal <laughs> because everybody must be thinking, when's she gonna shut up so I can go eat? I'm almost there. We've gotta catch up with Ahi because they really get it. And every time I come, I feel energized. I, I get these great insights. I learn so much. Our nation's prosperity depends on making sure that Latinos, young, old, all of us, and most especially those that will lead, that they have the education that they need in order for them to lead and have a good life. There is no question that education is a sound investment, and that's why we're here, that's what we're all about. 
and I know that you're going to do your part to see to it that tomorrow we will lead very responsibly. Thank you for your time y que Dios los bendiga.